I'm Laura Lucas Magnuson, and this is The World Unpacked. Now let's turn to the United States, to the city of Minneapolis. The city is still reeling from the death of an unarmed black man in police custody. Demonstrations over the death of George Floyd spread across six continents over the weekend. Chants of Black Lives Matter echoed from thousands of protesters in cities around the world. They were voicing anger not only at racism in the U.S., but also in their own country. Senior... French people also rallied against racism and police violence, highlighting the death of a black man in custody four years ago. And in Belgium, last week, protesters set fire to a statue of King Leopold II. Tens of millions... And I ask you to be here today, not only for George Floyd, but be here today as part of a movement to build a new society. We lost humanity on that day. And what we're doing right now in these protests, in these moments, as we risk ourselves in this pandemic, is fighting for humanity. Ashley Kwaku is an international development practitioner and visiting scholar in the Democracy, Conflict, and Governance Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Ashley, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Laura. It's a pleasure to be with you. Ashley, since George Floyd's murder by the police in Minneapolis on May 25th, protests have erupted across the United States and around the world. The sustained conversation about systemic racism feels different than in the past. Polling shows significant majorities supporting Black Lives Matter and the need for police reform. Before we get to the global implications of this movement, which is why we're grateful to have you on today, can you talk about what you see as unique about this moment? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's been amazing to watch this movement unfold. It's truly unprecedented. Uh, The New York Times just did an analysis showing that there have been somewhere between 15 million to 26 million people in the U.S. that have participated in these demonstrations over the death of George Floyd in recent weeks. Um, Nearly 5,000 protests across the country since late May in all 50 states, um, in highly populated urban areas to small rural towns alike, and, you know, including those that have quite conservative politics and, and few racial minorities. Um, the protests have been multiracial, multigenerational, and uh, and they've really been self-sustaining. They're actually still going on um, in some parts of the country. Um, so I think this is a really unique um, moment. I think the the sort of global reverberations and the sort of solidarity that those have uh, provided to the protesters domestically has also really um, you know enhanced the movement in the sense of the world really supporting this moment. Um, it's not the first time that, uh, you know, we've seen that kind of global support for civil rights in the U.S., but I think this is the first time it's been so enormous and so visible. And besides just the size, which uh, absolutely strike all of us and, and the sustained nature of them, is there something in particular about the moment that feels substantively different for you, emotionally different um, to you? I, just curious for your take about why now? Yeah, I mean, I... I do think that this is happening in a moment of uh, deep kind of, you know, exhaustion, um, fatigue, uh, you know, anxiety around the, the moment that we're having in terms of the pandemic, right? There's no, I think, accident that this uh, explosion is uh, has occurred, you know, during this deep uh, economic crisis and, and a health crisis that's obviously disproportionately impacting um, Black Americans as well as other minority groups, not just here, but also around the world. Um, and so I think the the outpouring into the streets in the in this in the context of that and the fact that it's been so incredibly broad based, um, you know, again, racially and otherwise, that feels quite different. I think the other uh, dynamic is that there's been some really tangible actions taken, um, you know, impacts of this in terms of the public policy uh, space, you know, certainly the dialogue that we're having as a country around even using term terminology like systemic racism is not something that, you know, a few months ago that, you know, is dominating our discourse. And I think, you know, in addition to that, we've seen, you know, some major reforms uh, being proposed and undertaken in some cases, you know, from Minneapolis, where the city council voted to eliminate uh, its police department from this whole debate about about police funding and municipal budget allocations, 
uh, as well. And then, you know, a whole host of legal reforms that that are on the table in some places around eliminating police chokeholds, eliminating qualified immunity, which has been a big uh, debate in this area. So I do think it seems different um, substantively in, in terms of what's happened as a result and also just the way that it feels in terms of the, the broad base of support it has garnered. Yeah. And talking about that broad base of support, at the same time that Americans were in the streets, we saw large demonstrations across Europe and also in places like South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and Japan even. These demonstrations were not only standing in solidarity with Black Americans, it seemed, but also protesting legacies of systemic racism in those countries. Can you tell us a bit more about how systemic racism manifests in other Western democracies? What, if any, impacts are these protests having in those countries? There is rightly a lot of focus on the United States for its you know, deep problems with uh, police brutality, with systemic racism, particularly in the criminal justice sector. So, of course, I think there's you know, good uh, focus in that, on that issue. But I think if we focus exclusively on the U.S., we miss understanding the ways in which similar challenges exist in other, particularly Western democracies, and are disproportionately harming Black um, and Indigenous populations there. Um, and this is a phenomenon that's prevalent, you know, everywhere from the United Kingdom to Brazil, where more than three quarters of people killed by the police in the last decade were black men. Um, in these countries, you know, it's a smaller population than we have in the U.S. in terms of black people. And I think the sort of smaller numbers have perhaps obscured the degree to which people sort of recognize that the same similar kind of anti-Black bias is permeating institutions um, in other countries as well. But I think if we look at some of the evidence, we see that it actually does, you know, play out that way. And one of the hallmarks sort of of some of these protests in here in the United States has been the issue of monuments and taking down monuments. But interestingly, that has also been a global issue. Um, so how do you see the sort of global reckoning with the glorification of colonial leaders like Cecil Rhodes in the United Kingdom and King Leopold in Belgium? What, as a scholar, does this tell you the interest in monuments? So in the U.S., I think we are used to seeing Confederate monuments, you know, be the site of protest and counter protest around our history, around the narrative of that history, particularly as it relates to slavery and Jim Crow and other other uh events uh, related to race relations in this country. I think it's been super fascinating and, and really unexpected, at least for me, to see the killing of George Floyd drive, you know, similar kinds of debates over monuments in other countries and stimulate uh, Western democracies to grapple with their own um, heroes and narratives. Um, you know, the legacies of which were forged through colonialism um, and empires that inflicted, you know, horrible violence on Black people around the world. Um, you mentioned uh, Cecil Rhodes in the UK. This isn't the first time that, at least in the UK, that there's been a big debate about Cecil Rhodes, statues of C Cecil Rhodes. In, um, in 2015, there was a movement called the Rhodes Must Fall movement that really began in South Africa as an effort to remove a statue of Cecil Rhodes uh, from the University of Cape Town campus, uh, Cecil Rhodes being a, a colonial leader uh, from the British Empire. And, um, and that movement uh, spread over then to the UK, to Oxford University, um, as a means for students to elevate the, the issue of institutional racism there. Um, and so I th th think that movement has kind of been renewed now um, in the context of the protests in the UK. Um, and now, interestingly, a majority of Brightons now want to see statues of slave traders removed from public places, which is an interesting, I think, development. Um, you know, Belgium is, a, is another really interesting example where uh, these statues of King Leopold II are, are being evaluated in a new light as citizens in Brussels come to terms with, you know, a historical narrative that's really papered over his role in the enslavement and death of millions of Congolese people during the colonial era there. Um, and I think the other kind of, for me, super interesting dynamic here too is the degree to which these debates are not just happening in white majority countries. Um, they're happening in non-majority non white countries as well, like in Brazil, which also has quite deep problems with institutional racism against uh, its black population. And they too have colonial era uh, statues of Portuguese colonizers 
uh, and there's been focus on on looking at those and, and perhaps taking them down as well. So it's super in, it's super interesting to see a real global reexamination of uh, of these sort of lionized figures that have shaped the world as we know it, and to really complexify the narratives around you know around the stories of these of these countries and to show there were winners and there were losers in these stories. And I think this, you know, it's yet to be seen what steps countries might take to start to reconcile that. And speaking of the stories we tell about ourselves, in your new piece for Carnegie, you argue that Western democracies are often advocates for human rights and democratic governance around the world, but that this movement highlights the cracks in the credibility of their own democratic institutions. What will be the implications for democracy globally or even for the foreign policy of the United States? With regard to its relationships with minority communities, the United States is is kind of a cautionary tale on what not to do. Um, obviously, you know, racial bias in policing and the violence that it wreaks on Black communities here has eroded whatever relationship the government has had with Black communities. It's it's never been a good one, and and this certainly further erodes that. And I think the concern is that there are signs that there are similar trends that are happening in other Western democracies, where there are Black people living there who likewise experience police brutality and other kinds of racial discrimination. Um, and they feel uh, that they have no, no recourse. So just like one example of, you know, how this is presenting itself, you know, in a, in a 2018 survey, 30% of Black Europeans across 28 EU member states reported experiencing racist harassment. Okay, the majority of those people who said they had experienced this harassment, um, and this is like, you know, racist violence, physical attacks by police officers, they're not reporting it. So they're experiencing it, not reporting it to any kind of authority mechanism. They don't think it's going to change anything. And because they don't trust the police. Um, In Belgium, um, Afro-Europeans there are four times more likely to be unemployed than white Belgians, despite you know being more highly educated on average. Eighty um, percent there say they've been victims of discrimination and, and and targets of racial slurs. So I think this is a big problem again in the U.S. But the citizen-state you know relationship, which is kind of how we talk about these things in the democracy space is really um, broken um, in lots of places with uh, particularly Black populations, but I'm sure more broadly than that. And I think that's definitely a huge problem for democracy and the degree to which we're seeing more and more people kind of uh, have their eyes open to that and, and recognize that. It sort of a, becomes a much more broad uh, legitimacy issue for democracies writ large. We'll be back in a moment to dig deeper into the data about racism in Western democracies. Ashley, let's talk about how we should be evaluating these problems. You have noted that there is a lack of quantitative data and analysis about systemic racism in Western democracies. What are the major barriers to data collection? This is a really complicated issue. It's taken me some time to get my head around it. But um, let's like look at Europe for an example. So Europe has a set of anti-discrimination directives that prohibit discrimination based on race or ethnicity in a whole host of categories like housing, employment, social security, access to education, et cetera. And so similarly, most EU member states also have national laws that align with this broader mandate as well. So the problem is that it's really hard to assess whether member states are complying with those anti-discrimination directives because there's very limited data. Um, And this is due to another um, EU directive on data protection, which says that you can't collect or process data on race or ethnic origin. So many governments don't, in fact, collect this data, um, citing that, that data protection directive. The problem here is that the data protection directive actually does provide for certain exceptions to to sort of the blanket, you know, no collecting any data on race or ethnicity. Of course, people can provide consent and and there are several other exceptions, but I think 
you know, there is a particular exception that says that um, if that data is necessary to exercise the rights of the data subject related to employment, social security, et cetera. So in other words, there are provisions in the directive which allow for the data to be collected for narrowly defined purposes and specifically for protection against discrimination. So is that basically when it's in the interest of the person who's making the complaint to actually share that da- that data? People can decide to opt in, but more broadly, there's a there's sort of a public interest carve out that if it's sort of a in the public interest to protect uh, uh, this data subject or sort of to enforce anti discrimination measures, um, that it's in the public interest to have that data. Um, but there's just a sort of hiding behind this uh, this pro this broader prohibition um, and. And, and so, you know, most governments or many governments aren't, you know, aren't collecting any data. So um, the so this sort of creates difficulties when it comes to sort of examining and understanding uh, the degree to which other requirements around anti-discrimination are being um, enforced or not. It's really just difficult to monitor that. Is one of the complications, too, of data collection uh, sort of rooted in European history and World War Two and, and the way that Germany was you know, collecting data about its citizens at that point and sort of a reticence to do that in modern days? Yeah, that's another really important dynamic here that I was going to uh, was going to also speak to, which is that, you know, the traumas from World War II really hang over the idea of discussing race or racism in Europe, let alone collecting data on it. So one of the reasons why, you know, governments don't want to do that is because of the the impact of race science, these debunked theories that certain races, i.e. white people, were biologically superior to other races. And those beliefs led to horrible, horrible atrocities. And so a real aversion to talking about racism and to the idea of government tracking race-related data. So this is rooted in some real um, history and fears. Um, And in many countries, it, it has like led to this willingness to live with some degree of discrimination if it meant that the government or the state was going to stay out of your business. And do you think that the global protest movement might bring down some of these barriers or change those norms around data? You know, I I think that we're seeing um, the global protest movement start some conversations um, just about even acknowledging, uh, you know, that there might be sort of more systemic problems around um, race, racism in, in institutions um, in other democracies. But I'm not sure that that we're going to see that needle move uh, so quickly. I think we're seeing, you know, some evidence that this moment is causing a reexamination of police practices. Uh, France, for example, has announced a ban on chokeholds, uh, but they're still denying um, any systemic violence against people of color in their policing systems or practices. Same with Germany. Again, they're launching a probe into looking at the issue of racial profiling, but uh, the the government there is also, you know, there's nothing to see here systematically. Um, so I think that uh, there, the uh, data question, I think if civil society is certainly, I think, going to continue to raise this to sort of say we can't really understand the nature of the problem without uh, more information um, and that minority communities, uh, you know, are disproportionately being impacted. But I don't necessarily see that that. Uh, that change happening overnight. And from your research perspective, what are the impacts of this lack of data? Um, you said civil society will push for it to make for better policy. How do you see it as a researcher? Yeah, so I think um, I think COVID-19 or the coronavirus pandemic is a, a perfect example of how the lack of, of data in Europe, they're calling it like quality data, but data on racial uh, background, ethnic origin is impacting public policy. So, for example, in the U.S., the Black American community, um, they're more like more than four times more likely than whites to be hospitalized from the coronavirus. Um, Black and Latinos are, are more than twice as likely to die. So from a disease management from a disease management perspective, this, you know, should be really critical information to have. And I think that what for whatever reason, the vulnerability that Black people in the U.S. are facing for, uh, to this virus is not unique to the to the United States. Um, in the United Kingdom, 
Uh, data from early May showed that Black people were more than four times likely to die from COVID than whites. Um, Norway has, uh, has, its public health experts have found that people born in Somalia are are contracting COVID-19 at rates more than 10 times the national average. So they're Somali-born citizenry, in other words, are are, are contracting it. 10 at, times. 10 times, much higher rate. So, wow. you know, in terms of knowing who's vulnerable so that the public policy response can target, um, you really need that information. Um, and, and, and places like Canada, Brazil, uh, they've been critiqued um, by their own public health systems for not uh, collecting that data so they can mount, you know, a more effective response. And we don't often talk about racism as a measure of how democratic performance is evaluated. What would need to change in order to more intentionally consider racism in this area? Or how would you think about it manifesting in democracy rankings, for instance? Well, I, yeah. So I think this data question um, it's complicated, but I think it's a real constraint um, to understanding the nature of the problem. Um, but I think more broadly, systemic racism is not something, as you said, that's really considered in the assessment of democratic performance. It's not something that is measured in the big global democracy indices. Um, it isn't prominently examined in human rights reports, particularly in Western countries. It's just not an area that the global democracy community has been deeply examining. Um, and, but I think too, more broadly, like outside of the United States, black populations are small population groups in, in most Western countries. So because they're a small group, we often miss the degree to which they're experiencing, you know, discrimination and racism um, and how it's really impacting um, them disproportionately. Um, and so, I'll look, I'll take an example um, of a country that um, has for the last three years gotten a perfect score on a freedom index uh, put out by Freedom House, uh, an NGO that looks at measuring political and civil liberties of countries around the world. Um, Finland gets a perfect score, but uh, again, a survey of Black Europeans around 28 countries in the EU, Finland gets the highest rates or highest reported rates of race-based harassment and violence by Black people living there. So there's just a disconnect, I think, between this idea that a perfectly free country would have such high proportions of people who really don't feel free, who feel harassed, who feel um, discriminated against. And that, that's something that the community, I think, needs to reconcile. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be right back in a moment to discuss what's next. Ashley, we talked a little bit about what factors make this global movement different than the ones we've seen in the past. It also seems as if there is a new or reinvigorated appetite for lasting change. So if you're a policymaker in Washington, Paris, Brussels, Helsinki, or Sydney, how do you tackle the problem given its enormity? What might be your first move? Yeah, I'm certainly glad that I'm not um, you know, a decision maker here because it's a hard question. There's certainly no one size fits all solution um, to this problem. I think the aspirations and experiences of black communities in all of these different places that are that are protesting have been quite varied. Um, and the demands have been some in some cases similar around criminal justice and policing, but but in other cases um, different. And so I think one super important first step for governments to take is to start to acknowledge uh, the degree to which these problems exist and to engage with their minority populations in more meaningful ways. Um, I do think that in the U.S., um, there's been this focus uh, particularly on the municipal budgeting process. And it sounds super boring to talk about budgets. Um, it's not you know, the most interesting part of our public policy, but it's super important. And I think we've seen the ways in which citizens have been moving the needle to influence uh, how budget allocations are made, driving shifts away from policing and toward education, mental health, and other social services. And so I think that that's another really interesting way that policymakers can think about how to get closer to citizens, how to see how they would prioritize uh, the investment of public resources. And that would be a great place to start. 
you know, talking about systemic racism in America as a foreign policy problem is not new. I certainly remember conversations around this when I was in the State Department for a decade, but it really doesn't get the attention that it deserves. How do you think that the global democracy and foreign policy communities themselves can contribute to untangling this problem? So I think it's critically important as well. And I think I, I think one way is to look to the global democracy community to more systematically measure racial equity and inclusion in their assessments of democratic performance. I think we should do more to reward, acknowledge, and lift up the countries and the models that are effectively addressing this issue so that the rest of us can learn. Um, so I think that requires better indicators as well as better data. And I think that as far as foreign policy more broadly, you know, domestic racism, as I'm sure you know from your experience at the State Department, has always undermined our foreign policy objectives. Um, some of our most significant civil rights achievements, like Brown versus Board of Education, have um, in part been a result from the need to address our global standing, which at the time was suffering uh, because of the images of the human rights abuses taking place at home. Um, so I think our foreign policy is enhanced when our domestic house is in order. And I think that the foreign policy community can do more to speak out against systemic racism here at home and to make those critical linkages to the same issues where they exist abroad. Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to be across the table from a diplomatic interlocutor when you are, you know, delivering a demarche on their uh, civil rights issues, um, human rights issues, and they turn around, you know, and point the finger at you. I think um, that's always been a vexing issue that the State Department hasn't really ever grappled with that well. You know, as we look ahead, then, uh, what factors might impact the sustained momentum and ultimate success of these protests? How might you even think about what success means? So I think the momentum of this movement in the context of a pandemic, a global pandemic, um, has already been really remarkable. Um, I think that we are seeing inst institutions across American society really uh, start to assess the ways that they have perpetuated systemic racism and to grapple with um, how to address it. And certainly there's a lot of work to be done to hold these institutions to account for civil society and other watchdogs to see how um, implementation goes and to follow that through. Um, I think that success will also depend on kind of the specific goals that for people who have been protesting uh, around police brutality, how those goals uh, as articulated by the protesters are going to be, um, are going to be measured. They, Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S. is really focused on the issue of police funding and um, the allocation of other kinds of resources for, for Black communities. So that's going to be a critical metric of success um, if budgets are changing, budget, budget allocations are changing, and other kinds of reforms like uh, chokeholds and qualified immunity will be important, really, milestones for this for this movement. But I think, too, it's like the the demands, you know, in other places in 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 Europe and in Brazil and in Australia or New Zealand, those are probably going to be different and need to be tailored to the to the unique context. For example, we might see in Europe a renewed focus on data collection and reporting around anti-discrimination. How hopeful are you about the power of the current movement to create this lasting change? I am definitely an optimist. <laughs> so I'm very hopeful. I think again, just Going back to some of the comments I made at the beginning of our conversation, this is a really unique moment, um, and there is really a broad base of support now for uh, the issue of racial justice and racial equity, and I think it's a global kind of consensus that's grown out of that. So I'm optimistic that there's been a uh, tipping point in the way that we're having this public discussion um, and that we're seeing uh, real changes being proposed uh, in so many different ways from programs to policies to budgets. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, the risk of this, the time that this is happening in, in is also that we're still grappling with the global pandemic. Um, it's already kind of overtaken the national debate uh, here in the U.S. and and global attention, particularly in places where it's flaring up again, 
Um, so there is a risk that this becomes kind of a back burner issue um, as, as we grapple with the public health and economic fallout of all of that. Um, and so I think that the degree that to which we can remember how intrinsically linked the issues of systemic racism are to the impacts of this virus on Black communities, on Indigenous communities, uh, particularly the health and economic impacts, the more that we're going to ensure that there truly is lasting change for racial equity and justice um, in the post-pandemic world. I would totally agree with that. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ashley. Thank you. Till next time. Thank you for listening to The World Unpacked, produced by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. We're grateful for your listen and eager for your feedback. We welcome your emails at podcasts at ceip.org. And please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find me, Laura Lucas Magnuson, on Twitter, at Laura L. Magnuson. These discussions are only made possible by our wonderful team behind the pod. Our audio engineer is Tim Martin, and our executive producer is Maya Krishna Rogers. We'll see you next time.